But we're in our series on, on grace in the Old Testament. And uh, I started a few weeks ago, um, we started off with the scapegoat um, offering. And then last week we looked at how that, that burnt offering brings us acceptance um, with God. One thing we have to try to remember is that the law shows us to be sinners, which uh, shouldn't be a great revelation, is it? Right? Because, but, but, but the law shows our true condition apart from Jesus Christ. It shows us uh, what a mess that we are. But if that were the end of the story, that would be pretty depressing, wouldn't it? Because what do you do if you're a sinner? Right? And so Jesus, I mean, the Lord, even in the Old Testament, provided a way uh, of sacrifice until Jesus would come. Now, we celebrate the Lord's Supper every week, and I, and I love that we do. And I, the reason I love that we do is because the communion service or the Lord's Supper, whatever, how you ever, however you refer to it, brings us back where all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament are pointing to. It reminds us that the gospel is good news, not because there is something for us to do, because, but because it declares what Jesus has done. And, and, and every service that we have it, I sit there and I take that bread and dip it in the, in the cup, which is a picture of his shed blood and his broken body. And I take it and I say, okay, Lord, that, that reminds me. It's not, it doesn't depend on me, but it's Christ in me and it's Christ in you. And because of that perfect sacrifice, we are, are in fellowship with him. So while the law can identify the problem, which is important, right? Because sometimes we think, you know, you, you just look at, look at the culture that we live in. You, you can't even get people to identify the problem. And if you can't identify the problem, you can't identify the solution. And so the law identifies the problem uh, which, and, and brings guilt, condemnation, and death. And yet Jesus came to be the solution to the problem, not just the problem of our sinning, which is a problem, but the problem of our being sinners. And this is the important thing. The, the, the gospel is good news, not just because he solves our sinning problem, because he solves our nature problem. And the passage that Brad was reading before communion takes us to the place where we realize at the end of Romans 7, it, it's supposed to give you this picture of despair. And in, in, in the real Bible, in the King James Version, <laughs> it says, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? He wants you to have this picture because in the Roman times, the worst form of condemnation, what they do is they would take the the one who had murdered somebody, they would take the body of the corpse and they would tie it hand to hand, foot to foot, face to face, and let the corruption of the corpse that they had killed infect their body and bring them to a slow, perilous death. And this is the picture that Paul's painting in Romans 7. He said, who will deliver me? You can't deliver yourself. But then don't, don't lose hope because in the moment of despair, the gospel always comes and intersects into our lives. And they, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And you've, if you haven't been there, you just really don't know what it is to be in Christ, do you? And he says, I thank my God. Right? Because it always brings us back to to God. We are never the solution. God's the solution. And then, and then in chapter 8, and remember, when the Bible was written, they didn't have chapter headings. It was just the next verse. He says, there is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. And so, so the law brings out and identifies for each of us the problem that we all have. And the sacrifices show us that we are invited into fellowship. When you look at the book of Leviticus, look at it through the lens of the finished work of the cross. Because Leviticus is an invitation to fellowship with God. In his grace, he's provided the sacrifices to secure us in a place of acceptance and fellowship. Now let's read 
Uh, Leviticus chapter number 2, verse 1 through 3. When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take from it a handful of fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense, and the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with the pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. Well, Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. And we thank you for preserving your word for us that we might dig into it and mine out the jewels that you have for us. And Lord, I'm just so grateful. Now, I, I just pray that you would speak through your servant into the hearts of your beloved. Lord, I'm not exactly sure where you want to take us or how fully this morning. So just give me the words to say and keep me from saying anything that would hinder your working in us. Lord, if there are those who have yet to receive you here this morning, I pray that this morning they put their trust in your finished work and be born again of your spirit and know life in the offering of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. So he, he, he brings this offering, and he says, and when anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, what, what I want you to see is that most of these offerings here are completely voluntary. Like the, it was just as God moved upon your heart. You know, it, it, as, a, as a matter of principle at faith, we'll, we'll let you know what the needs of the church are, but we're never going to guilt and shame people or say, you got to do this or you got to do that. It, it's it's the, the way we give in the new covenant is give as we're moved by the Spirit of God with a heart of generosity and a heart that's filled with joy. And this grain offering was the people coming with, with after they, they had, had the harvest, they, they, they were recognizing the, with a heart of gratitude God's provision. And so maybe, you know, we just need to stop and ask ourselves, do I recognize that God is the source of all that I have? It changes everything. I remember, you know, in the legalistic days, one, one guy, guy was preaching, and he said, man, and, he, you know, they're preaching very dogmatically that, that um, 10% was God's and 90% was yours. So you give God his 10 and 90 is yours. And, you know, as I thought about that, isn't everything I have God's? Do you know what I'm saying? Were, were we not a people bought with a price? And when you're purchased out of the slavery of sin, does not everything you have belong to him? I mean, we talk about the lordship of Christ, but that's recognizing the reign of God. And so our offerings are to be reflected, right? This grain offering was a reflection of their gratitude and their heart that was full of joy. Uh, it was a recognition that God was our provision. Can we not admit, friends, that, that God has provided for us? That was pretty anemic. I mean, for a bunch of one percenters. Right? You remember, you know, I don't mean to get into politics because I, I don't trust any of them. But, but the, my point really was that there was this thing coming out, right? And, you're, you know, he's a one percenter. And I'm like... Yeah, what, what are you talking about? We're all one percenters. Most of us, me, first of all, am constantly dealing with my weight, trying to be healthy and keep my cholesterol under control and my blood pressure under. And, you know, the doctors, every 10 pounds you lose, your, your blood pressure will come down. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not real high on doctors. I, I love doctors, but, you know. Anyways, given my retirement to doctors. But, but my point is really almost all of my health problems, not all of them, but almost all of them have something to do with excess. Am I right? Yeah, I got an amen out of this. Yeah, I got to get some more Baptists back in here, you know. <laughs> Sitting there going, hey, am I talking to myself? 
it's just the, the fact is, right? Now, now, the reality probably is, is that we have mismanaged the resources of God and put ourselves in financial dilemmas so that we feel somehow we're in hardship. But the reality is most of our issues have something to do with excess. I love going overseas. I haven't been able to go because of my health issues, but I, I love going to Sri Lanka. I love going to India because I, I live here in poor Bernie in the hill country, and it's poor me, you know, and I'm just barely making it, you know. And I get on a plane, and I go across the world, and I deal with people afflicted with leprosy who are on the verge of starvation very often, and I remember how affluent I am. And somehow, all of us need to have regular eye openers where we come to the place where we realize we have so much to be grateful for. And, 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 and our giving should be a reflection of our gratitude to God. But if you get self-absorbed, you're going to come into this thing and think, oh, poor me, poor me, I'm just driving the Escalade. Right? What, you know what I'm saying? It's like we, we, we have this kind of strange way of figuring, thinking, of, oh, poor me, because maybe a couple of years ago we had more affluence. But maybe the difficulties that we go through are to remind us at the core how incredibly blessed of a people that we are. And so it should be reflected in the way that we give. And it's voluntary. It recognizes our stewardship of his resources. And if you look at this, he said, they, they came. There, there was no compulsion. It was just an offering made available to the people. So whether the offering plate comes by or in the near future, we're planning to put out offering boxes so that we can kind of save time. And we'll have some, what we, I like to call, I don't know what the elders are going to call it, but I like to call them joy boxes, right? Because sometimes they'll, someone will say tithe boxes. I said, don't limit yourself to a tithe. Why, why would you do that? Give with a heart of joy. And have those around the church so that you can come and just, as a part of your worship, recognize how incredibly blessed you are. And you see that he came and they, they offered it and it was supposed to be a sweet fragrance. So the reality is that, that our offerings to God are voluntary. They come from hearts of joy that represent hearts of gratitude and it is a sweet aroma to the Lord. A pleasing aroma to him. And then the priests shared in it. And this was an interesting thing, that many of these offerings were kind of geared to be the provision for the priests or the, and the Levites so that they had a sustenance. So they, they, they lived by it. And, and you see this, it, that he came. That it produces sweet aroma to God. The grain offering was shared with the priests as a part of his provision or his family's provision. But well, you know what I was thinking was, really, Jesus was that grain offering right? He was the one who came from the Lord to be this offering. Now, can, can, I, can I cause you to stretch your thinking a little bit here in John chapter 12, verse 23 through 25? It says, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Wow, what an interesting word. Truly, truly, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. See, he gives, us the, he gives us and he's speaking. And he says, listen, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, what is it that glorified the Son? I want part of my purpose this morning when we look at this grain offering is to kind of force you to realize how twisted the American gospel has gotten. Now, I, 
Yeah, and I know I'm twisted. <laughs> I know I'm twisted. But living overseas for 28 years, like it, it'll do it to you. But, but, but let me explain to you. Who but Americans could come up with a health and wealth gospel and reconcile it with what Jesus taught? And the point isn't that you aren't blessed. You are richly blessed. And you are, you are richly prospered. But, it, but the idea that somehow God wants all of us completely healthy and completely wealthy, and that's the promise of the gospel, seems to be in direct conflict with Jesus' own experience. Like somehow he was preaching a message he wasn't experienced. And he says, listen, the time for my glorification has come. The glorification of Jesus Christ was not his miracles, although they were fantastic. The glorification of Jesus was not even the healings that he performed. The glorification of Jesus was not the feeding of the 5,000, though that was an amazing thing. The glorification of Jesus Christ was being nailed to a cross, suffering and becoming what we were. And we have here an empty cross to be a reminder that Jesus paid it all, but he's not on the cross anymore for a reason. Because his suffering is not ongoing, but he died on the cross. He became what we were. This is the, the whole point of 2 Corinthians 5, that he became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And this, my friends, the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus becoming the grain offering for us, is what reunites us in fellowship with Jesus Christ. This is what glorifies God. This is what brings the glory to him. Because why? Because it attributes to him what is, can only be received by him. Now, if you're getting a gospel message of do more, try harder, that puts 50% on God and 50% on you, who's it glorifying 50%? You and God. But do you realize, friends, I don't think that God shares his glory with mankind for long. So that's why we're not exalting you and we're not exalting me for sure. We're exalting the person of Jesus Christ because we're declaring that he has been all. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Now, I believe that Jesus is painting a picture first of who, what he was going to do. But I think much more than just what Jesus was going to do, he was calling you and I to participate in this grain offering. He, what does he tell? He tells a basic truth. Now, I, I, I am a self-confessed city kid. <laughs> I mean, I grew up in the city I didn't know anything when, Vanessa, when the Lord took Vanessa and I to the jungle of Thailand. I mean, we had to plant a garden for like vegetables and I had to read books about it. You know, I grew up in suburbia. I don't know anything about any of this agricultural stuff. You know, uh, my, you know, my pet dog was livestock. You know, I, I don't know anything about it. But even I learned that if you have a kernel of corn and you want a cob of corn, you've got to do something with the kernel. You have to sacrifice the life of the one to produce the many. And it's just a principle of agriculture that Jesus was sharing with them, whether it was wheat or corn or, or rye or any other substance that they would grow. What was he saying? He's saying, listen, he said, listen, this is something you know truly, truthfully, truthfully, I'm saying to you, if you don't take the grain of wheat and it doesn't fall into the ground and get covered up and allow itself to be corrupted and to die, it remains alone. It's just what it is. It's not a moral judgment. It's just what it is. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. But I'm trying, you know, I'm sitting there this morning meditating in my chair like, okay, Lord, how do I, how do, I do this? So I don't know if I'm going to succeed or not, but do you see, I think that he's talking to you and me too. What produces a fruitful life? 
Yeah, yeah. See, now, um, yesterday, um, after I, you know, I had some stuff in the morning, I had a prayer meeting, I had a lunch, and then, you know, I went home, and I was kind of sitting there, and turned the, 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 the box on, and was watching stuff, and, and, you know, I found out that I could have had, instead of a Toyota, I could have a Lexus for only 659 a month for, you know, and then, then my life would have been good. And I blew it, you know, I mean, <laughs> and, and, you know, I was just watching the advertisements and, and it's kind of interesting because in the advertisements, what it's always saying, the way to have life is to have more, right? Isn't that kind of the sum of it? Uh, the, the sum of it, it, it and, and, and they're not, you know, they know what they're doing because they know what we do. We think if we could just accumulate more, then we would have a fruitful life. And we Americans have been sucked into the lie to think that the accumulation of more, the, the, the gospel message of building b bigger barns, if we could just build a bigger barn, a bigger house and have more cars and more furniture and more money in the bank, and if we could just accumulate more, then we'd be living Right? And you see it, right? You know, you got your one house, you got to have the second house, you got to have the third house. You know, I, I met people in California in Palm Springs, and it was like mystifying to me because I just coming back from, the, from Asia, you know, and I'm like, and I'm sitting there and going, and here's this guy who's building this $7.8 million, 6,000 square foot home on the golf course, which he's going to live in four weekends a year. And I'm like, you know how many people I could feed with this house? Or just the maids? But don't, you know, don't judge those people. They're just doing what we do on a bigger scale. We're thinking that if we can just get a little bit more and do a little bit more, then we'll have life and look at it. What, what, Brad, is it Brad Pitt and, and Angelina Jolie, Jolene, Jolie? I'm sorry, I'm not good at movie stuff. Um, I was a Baptist too long, and I don't, you know. No, but I'm serious. Like, you know, I don't, I don't, that's not where I hang out. But, you know, what, I saw something, and it's Brad Pitt, right? And Angelina Jolie, with all of their kids, are going to have a messy $400 million divorce. Is that life? Well, you say, Pastor, I'm not going there. I just want $4 million. <laughs> That's where I... But do you see what I'm saying? If you set out for the 400 or the 4 million, it, you, you can never have enough because it's the opposite of what the gospel says. It, it, you're buying into the lie that by hoarding, by keeping more, by accumulating more, that I can have life. And Jesus is saying to you and to me, hey, it's just the opposite. It's when we come and we allow Jesus to bring us to the end of our own resources. When he brings us to the place where we realize that life is not the accumulation of more. Life isn't the accumulation of things. Listen, I am not trying to make you feel guilty about what you have. Please don't misunderstand me. I appreciate it. Enjoy it. And make your offerings a, an expression of gratitude, a hearts that are sacrificial to God, that, that come from hearts of joy. But don't look to those things to give you what it can't give you. He, he says, as long as you and I are the center point of life, what does it do? It produces death. It dies. The scripture says, it remains alone. And so all of our preoccupation with self produces death. Maybe, maybe it's just like the older you live, the more this becomes real because you've tried it. Like, I, I don't know, but I, I just, I'm completely convinced of what I'm trying to tell you. 
I'm just trying to tell you, I have a heart full of joy and gratitude about what God gives you, but, but, but realize, listen, it's when, when life ceases to become about you and the accumulation of more and the gaining of higher status and, and, and the enrichment of self, then life becomes fruitful. He says, whoever loves his life loses it. I'm telling you what, you put this into a marketing scheme, you ain't selling nothing. <laughs> Am I right? Like, this is like, what? Who would buy that? But you see, friends, we got to come to the realization that the true gospel is countercultural. I, I read a book that said I, too, could be a cool preacher if I would just untuck my shirt. No, I'm serious. And you go watch podcasts. All the cool guys have their shirt untucked. I'm afraid my fat belly would show. And, and I'm just having a little bit of fun of the way we have transferred the... We, we, changed the gospel and Americanized it and culturized it and made it all about us so that even you and I, you know, we come and go based on how we feel and what we like and our preferences. And if they don't do it the way I like, I'm going to leave. And what's that about? It, it, it's, it's, it's a proclamation of the gospel of self that exalts self and forget. It's almost like Jesus is my divine vending machine and I just put a few quarters in and he gives me what I want. But if you're listening to Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, my friends, he's saying, listen, whoever loves his life ends up losing it. I don't know. I think it was Jim Carrey, I read this quote saying something. He goes, I wish everybody could be rich and famous because then they would find out that being rich and famous isn't what makes life. I don't know nothing about him, except for he's pretty funny and perverted. So don't watch him. <laughs> but it's kind of true, right? I, I loved his honesty. And the rest of us are sitting there, oh, I just wish I could be rich. I don't need to be famous. I just, if I could just be rich, then all my problems would go away. Oh. No. He tells us something that, that, that should be intuitive of, of us if we were walking the Spirit. He's saying the way to life is not the accumulation of more and the building up of this life. He's saying the way to life is to come to the end of this life, the end of seeking what this world is all about. It's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these things shall be added unto you. But we've made seeking the things of this world our focus, and we're trying to get the kingdom of God to buy in and help us get there. And Jesus is saying again and again, whoever loses his life, who loves his life, loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, I will be honest with you. I'm not a great theologian. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, the only thing I'm good at is really, really good at is messing up. So you can, you can disagree with this conclusion. But the reason I think it says, and whoever hates his life in this world is because if you're walking in the Spirit, you are going to see and experience a conflict of values. I just feel led of the Spirit to say this. Both of our presidential candidates are perfect reflections of our culture. There's a reason they're popular in their impopularity. He 
He's calling his friends. He's saying, listen, would you cherish not the cars you drive or the house that you live in or the, the retirement account that you are protecting? Uh, he's saying, and he's not saying it's wrong to have a retirement account or any of those things. He's just saying, would you turn your hearts and, and would you lead your children to the place where their hearts are fixed on the kingdom, where the priority is the kingdom of God, and where we realize that we who are Bible-believing Christians live for a different kingdom and for different values. And he says, and then we keep and we begin to experience eternal life now. Eternal life, my friends, is not something that begins when you die. Eternal life begins the moment that you believe and have the divine life living in you. We are the fruit of Jesus' offering. He allowed himself to go into the ground so that he could bring about much fruit. And we, friends, are that fruit. But it doesn't end with him bringing us. It's supposed to be us living for a different kingdom, for different values, for a different purpose, and forsaking the accumulation of more. I remember the parable of building bigger barns. And he, he goes, I'll just build a bigger barn and fill it up. And then he loses his life. And he says, what's the value of it? What, what my friends, when you end your life, does it, does it matter what you left to the IRS? If you didn't leave a heritage that pursued the kingdom of God and sought his kingdom first, he gave his life, think about this, to give us his life. And Jesus knew that the cross and resurrection was what would bring about his glory because he died not just for Melvin, he died so he could give Melvin his life. And having given Melvin his life, he says, now let me live through you. It's all an incredible picture of his grace. So that now you and I are partakers of the divine nature. And he's the source. So, the grain offering is free will. When you come next week, I hope you'll come with an offering. But it's all between you and God. And you say, Pastor, how much do I have to give? What's, what's God's and what's mine? Do you see the problem with that thinking? <laughs> no, I'm not okay. <laughs> you have to ask that question? <laughs> You've known me for four years. You know I'm not okay. <laughs> I'm disturbed. <laughs> You see what I'm saying, friends? I, if, if this 100% is mine, how little do I have to give up and still be good? <laughs> and you better protect it because someone's trying to get it. It's just what he's teaching against. He's saying, listen, Lord Jesus, it's all yours. Thank you for how you've blessed me. This is what you've moved on me, Lord. This, receive this as worship from heart of joy. And as I give, as he desires for me to give, I say no to me. And you should practice saying no to you. And let him bring us to the end of us.
so that through us, the divine life can manifest out and bring about much fruit. Because loving this life and what it's all about leaves you empty and dead. And coming and saying, Lord, I hate this conflict. I want it to be about your kingdom. Brings us to the place where we begin to experience the divine life. Yeah. Father, thank you. Thank you for the people who are here. And I just pray that somehow it'll, your spirit could make it make sense. And that we let you do what you want to do with it. In Jesus' name, amen.